Hello, Miami. You're watching 305 Sports Now, your home podcast and channel for all things Miami sports related. I am Will. I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now wake up! It's time to look at the enemy. Look in the mirror if he is no friend to me. Hello, Miami, and good afternoon. All right, today, thank you for watching 305 Sports Now. Okay, so we have... A very special guest. We'll be doing some Panthers talk, or as you can tell from the background, I have not forgotten that we do have a Stanley Cup champion in our region of South Florida. But the individual I'll bring on today is a radio lifer, man. I've, I'm, I'm a, been a fan of this guy for like 20 years, so it's an honor to have him on. Okay, he was the executive producer of the Joe Rose Show. He's worked with everybody from Channing Crowder to Mark Hawkman, all right, as well. He currently is a digital content producer for Odyssey. Here to do some Panthers talk and a little bit of Tua is none other than I just discovered is also a comic book nerd, Mr. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Oh, and let's not forget, he is the host of the podcast, Krantz Corner. Okay, you can find that on X, Instagram, etc. Mr. Zach Krantz, what's up, hey, man? How's hey. it going? Well, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words as well. And yes, out of all that, uh, my favorite part is I'm a comic book nerd. Yeah. <laughs> Me too, man. Like, like I told you before we started the show I, with with Corey Carmona, aka Chalupa Batman. You know, a lot of my audience, a lot of my audience listens to him as well, watches him as well. We did like forty minutes once of just straight Marvel talk. It was maybe even longer. That was my you first. Fall into with him. a rabbit hole, will you? Fall into a rabbit hole. When you, you do. Talk. If you find someone that enjoys it as much as you do, yeah. And and I got my brother into it. My brother didn't, you know, grow up like I did. Comic books every Friday and stuff like that at Walden Books in the malls, and and the old people will remember that. Uh, yep. When they had the little comic book section in the corner, um, he grew up watching me do that. And then all of a sudden, when the comic book movie started coming out, he started coming to me for like, is this what happens here with this guy? And I'm like, oh, well, in the comic books, it's a little different. But blah, blah, blah. So when you get in and now he's full fledged, like pre buying tickets for movies. I told you we already bought tickets for Deadpool and Wolverine. Yes. I am one of those guys. Yes. A month before it came out, I had tickets to it. <laughs> I'm, ex I'm going that Thursday night when it comes out at like 940 at night, if I could stay up that late. Um, and I'm just excited for it. But when you find someone in that category, it's like finding a sports person that just wants to talk about, like we're going to talk about the Panthers today. You could mm -hmm. fall into a rabbit hole for an yeah. hour. We could talk about Tua for an hour. The same thing with comic books and the Spider-Man movies and X-Men and blah, blah, blah. So it, I'm excited to be here. That's first off. But yes, out of all the accolades and all the nice things you said, my favorite thing you said was also a comic book. Nerd. That's great, man. That's great, man. It's it's good. It's good to find common ground, man. Commonality with with people that you have on. It's fantastic. Another one that uh, another individual I've had on as well is Bobby Melendez from from the Finstalk Sports Network. He is a major wrestling fan, and so am I. So we went NWO Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Right. We were supposed to talk about the Dolphins. <laughs> well, that's another thing. Listen, I grew up on wrestling too. I, yeah. I when I I told you before we started, I've got. Probably my my son's tuition and comic books in a in a, a attic in my parents' house. But right next to that, in about six plastic bins, is about seventy or eighty VHS cassette tapes of all the pay per view WrestleManias from like the second one and all of them through probably uh, that's eighty five, eighty six when that first one started. Probably through about ninety five, ten years of VHS cassette where I couldn't wait for my dad to pay the 5495 or whatever it was. I remember, yes. And I couldn't wait to get to the VCR to walk up to it and push play and record at the same time right when it started so I can make sure I could watch it every single day after that. I had them all up there. I can't wait to go see and get them digitized, but they're probably really crappy uh, because it was all on, you know, what was HD? There was no HGTV back yeah, in the it was, day. It was terrible. It was yeah, terrible. I, used to, right. I used to buy the documentaries, so I had... Right. It's funny though, because I had Bre I was a big Bret Hart fan. This was Hulk Hogan, but I was a big Bret Hart fan. I bought Wrestling with Shadows, the the documentary with the Montreal screw job within the documentary. So I have that one. I had the Stone Cold Steve Austin, Austin 316, when he actually right. uses the F word and they don't censor it. You know, so I had that one too, you know, as well. And I and I think I made a couple more that I purchased. So yeah, man, I love that. I love that era, man. Listen, man, I, my students ask me, would you rather grow up, you know, in our time period or grow up in yours? I said, no, nah, man. Mine. Mine. <laughs> 
I, you know my, what? I, 100% I wouldn't mine. be able to be a teenager in today's day with social media. Like, I don't know how I'd be able to handle it. I, yeah. I have a hard time handling it in my 40s right now when I'm just trying to promote Francis Corner or what mm-hmm. appearance I might be at or who's going to be on the radio show next week or yeah. a picture of my son on Instagram because I want my family to see it. I can't imagine growing up as a teenager today in social media. I'm glad I'm 45 years old. I'm glad I'm not 17 right now. So thank you. Yeah, no, so I totally to answer agree with your you. question, I agree with you also. I would rather grow up back in the, I was born in 79 in the, I'm an eighties baby. I, I like being an eighties baby. I still listen to eighties music. My wife hates it. I put it on. <laughs> I love 102.7, the beach down here. Uh, and they're an Odyssey station. So that's a little promotion there anyway, but I love the station in general because they play music that I could actually, I know the words to yeah. and not today's music that I just like the beats to. And that's it. Yeah, no, and, no and, I, and I agree with you. I mean, like I, I tell my kids, I go, I go, you guys, uh, you have to watch Heat games. You have to struggle sometimes because you may not have cable. You may not have Bally's. They used to be on Channel 33. I, I, I got to see That's Michael's right. Bulls on primetime NBC6. We didn't need a cable subscription back in those days. So you can keep <laughs> you can keep all that stuff, man. Sunday, I, I can, I, and I said this you know, to, I think it was my brother and my dad about a month and a half ago around Father's Day. Uh, I said, I always remember growing up on like Father's Day and Father's Day weekend. It was always seemed like it was Michael Jordan and the Bulls on yeah. that Sunday afternoon NBA finals game against what whatever team it was. It just seemed like it was every year like that, but you knew it. You heard the NBA and NBC music, which hopefully is going to be coming back sooner rather than later with the new deals with the NBA. But I just remember five o'clock, six o'clock, whatever it was on those Sundays, getting the barbecue for my dad going and sitting and watching somehow the Bulls beat the Knicks or the Heat or the Celtics or the whoever it was. But it was always like kind of like that NBA finals or right before the NBA finals. Always good like that, but you're right. I didn't need you know Netflix and Paramount Plus and yeah. all, and, and Peacock and all. I had a TV. And by the way, growing up and God, we were going old school, and I like this. Yeah. Growing up, folks, there was no remote controls. You're looking at the remote control for my dad growing up. He was, <laughs> when it was channel six to channel ten, and there was no Fox back then. It was just like four, six, and ten uh, when you were watching the regular channels. When we wanted to go from four to six, you know who had to get their ass off the couch. Not my dad. It was me. I went and I went and I changed it for him and I came back to the couch, changed it again. I would go up and do it again. Folks, you have it lucky these days with remote controls and stuff like that. The digital world has helped out a lot of people and it made has. the old people pissed off. Right. Yeah, no, it totally has. Then now you can just you don't even have to like find it. You can just voice control yeah, and say, right. open Netflix, boom, it's there. You know, <laughs> open Google, boom, it's there. You know, open Plex, whatever that free one, it's right. there. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. I like it. That's one thing I did give my kids. I go, I like your streaming. That is that is fun. The idea of streaming and having everything available, you know, I don't uh, at one time. Right. But if you ask me, I kind of enjoyed driving to Blockbuster. If you ask me, I enjoyed not having to pay for cable so I could watch, you know, Michael, like you said, in some cases, sadly, obliterate the heat, right. you know. But I did wake up to the, what was it, Superstars with WWF at the time. Oh, so yes. it was fantastic. Saturday morning cartoons yes. are, are a legendary and I feel bad for the kids nowadays because now you get cartoons all day long on the Cartoon Network or this That's channel. Though. But I remember waking up on Saturday mornings to Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Yes. To the WWE cart- WWF cartoon back yeah. then. It wasn't WWE. It was WWF still back then. Uh, I know it sounds weird, but like the Q-Bert com- like cartoons, like there were so many cartoons that I would look forward to on Saturdays. And I feel like that was such a special morning to wake up, get a bowl of cereal and sit out there on my, on my butt for about four hours and I would never be in trouble for doing that. And man, those days are long gone and it stinks. Um, but yeah, str- binging shows now and stuff like that. It's kind of fun when, when you find a show you like, so I, it's kind of a give and take. No, absolutely. I totally agree with you. No, no, and, 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 I, and I give, I'll give my, I'll give Gen Z their flowers. Millennials are flowers when, when I think they're reserved. And like I said, streaming has made things a lot easier, but again, man, uh, going back it's like i never had to worry about missing a dolphin game uh, nope. because i had to find the, the right cable channel never had to worry about missing you know a heat game because i don't have valleys you know because now valleys is bankrupt you know so those are things that i didn't have to worry about because they were always locally regionally televised you know that's that's pretty much what i say this is fun man we just spent 10 minutes talking about like <laughs> listen <laughs> yeah, and, 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 just... and before we even get into the panther stuff i'll leave we'll leave it on this we'll close old school talk on this if you never did it you'll never understand the thrill, the excitement, the happiness, or the sad part of going to a blockbuster video on a Friday yeah. morning when those new releases came out. And my mom, I would send her with a list of the three new releases and she would show up and stand in a line at the door 
to rent two movies for the weekend and how amazing it would be when I would come home on a Friday afternoon from middle school or elementary or even in high yeah. school sometimes. And my mom would have the two videos with the red parts on the front. She got the two new releases for the weekend. That's going to be a fun weekend. Kids will never understand the thrill of running into a blockbuster video to make sure you get those new releases for the weekend. It's a, it's a, it's a lost art. And I feel bad for the people that never had to go through. No, I totally agree. Get you out of the house. You, you got you know, the disappointment of, of uh, not seeing the movie and new releases. Cause it right. said, sorry, being rented. Uh, okay. that, that, that's something that I, I remember <laughs> growing yeah. up. Kids you will know. never understand it. Will nah. like we, I mean, I know we're, we're talking like old men here, but those, those were fun days. Like those growing up in the eighties and in the early nineties, I know we didn't have technology and, and maybe you had a beeper or you got to, uh, especially when the early nineties came around, got to maybe borrow your, your mom or dad's phone because they had free weekends, you know, Friday night at like six o'clock when the weekend started and it was unlimited calls all weekend long. And yeah. You could be the cool kid with your dad's cell phone for the weekend, answering calls, looking cool. Man, those were good days. Now it's just, it's totally different now, but again, and besides the fact that after all this conversation, I feel old as hell now, right? <laughs> it's okay, man. We're aging gracefully. <laughs> I know. You can see it. You can see it. All right. Absolutely. Well, well, we're finally talking about the Panthers right now, <laughs> but I, but I, but again, I, I love I love doing I love doing old school talk whether it's wrestling, comic books, and the bat the, the past and so on, right. as well. Um, like I said, you, you're not about the same age. You know, uh, you're about a year, you're you're older than me, 45, 44, and so we both grew up around the same time. We were all excited about Panthers hockey. I mean, Panthers hockey was coming. The Marlins had just come out. Now the Panthers, South Florida is getting hockey. It was always said that hockey would not survive in South Florida. I personally never believed that because because I just like sports when I was a kid altogether, and I, I always rooted for South Florida teams. How did you feel when the the Florida Panthers and John Van Beesbrook and Scott Mellenby and Brian Screwlin and Robbie Niedermeyer and Stu Barnes all uh, all graced us with their skates at the Miami Arena before they first started? It was fun. It was something new. Uh, as you know, as you just said before, I'm born and raised here in South Florida, so the early years of sports for me was just football. It was all football. Or my parents were, you know, my dad's from Brooklyn. Uh, my mom's from you know Miami Beach, but she grew up in New York also. So if there were teams outside of the Dolphins and Hurricanes to root for football-wise, as sad as it sounds, I rooted for like the Mets. Uh, I rooted for the Knicks because we didn't have the Heat. We didn't have the Marlins. My parents were not huge hockey fans, but like my dad would root for the Rangers if they were on and playing. Uh, the only teams I could watch down here that, that were baseball, if TBS, you had the Atlanta Braves, WGN, you had the Cubs. And the, you had the New York teams if you wanted to check it out. So outside of the football teams, I rooted for New York teams because that's where my parents were from, my cousins were from. But let me tell you, when the Panthers came down and the Marlins came down and the Heat were born, everything changed in my house. My dad went all local. We're not rooting for the Knicks anymore. We're Heat fans. We're not rooting for the Rangers or any of the other. We're Panther fans. Marlins are our baseball team now. Um, I never thought – I was I'm, I was skeptical. I never thought growing up that hockey would ever make it down here because – I just wasn't sure. We're not a t we're not a a community that has a lot of ice hockey practice places and and teams around here. So I wasn't sure how that was going to all work out. Um, but it was fun. It was really cool to have your own team down here, and especially when you're an expansion team in the beginning and you're going to struggle and you're going to be bad for a couple of years. Well, it only took a couple of years to jump out of that, and then all of a sudden, boom, your team is making a Stanley Cup run. So it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of excitement. It's what happened after that for the next 20 years that we'll get into that kind of stunk. But that run, Beezer is still a figure, historical figure in South Florida sports. Don Van Beezer might not be recognized at a Publix if he walked around, but I promise you if he was at a Panthers game being recognized, the place would jump up and down yes. for him. Be, same thing. Paul Laus, the whole, all these guys that were on those teams early uh, would walk around in a Panthers arena and they're royalty. And it's cool to see that. And it's cool to see that now we have a history on top of the fact if we fast forward in 30 years, we finally have a Stanley Cup down here in, 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 in South Florida. We have a, a team that's won a championship. I think you need to kind of get to that to really be one of those you know markets. But I'll tell you, the fan base is the, the smaller fan base that's been loyal through all these years. I, I, I high five. I, I dap them. It, it's great to see that. But going back to what you said before, I was a little skeptical in the beginning. But basically, because I didn't know much about it. I didn't grow up with hockey, so I didn't know much about it. I still, to this day, you're going to laugh. Probably couldn't tell you in a definition what icing is, uh, but I laugh at all this stuff. I root for the team. I've been diehard for a couple of years now. Obviously, um, 
since they started winning, the bandwagon has gotten full. I am not going to be a phony and say that I have not jumped back on the bandwagon in the last four or five years. I loved what they started doing. But like we said, going back to those original Stanley Cup run, boy, that was a lot of fun in the old Miami Arena. That was cool. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I mean, I remember Doug McLean, who was the head coach and who I believe right. was, wrongful, who was wrongfully fired uh, by our general manager. I think it was Brian Murray at the time, you know, cool. uh, ends up firing, you know, Doug McLean. My personal opinion, he wanted to put his brother as the head coach because he was fired sure. from the Flyers. So a little nepotism there. So that's why I think he did it. But that team was just scrappy. It, it, you never knew who was going to score a goal. That's what made him so unpredictable. And he, even the Avalanche acknowledged that they would have rather have faced the Penguins because all you had to do was stop Yager and Lemieux. Right. But you never knew if it was going to be Stu Barnes, Robbie Niedermeyer, Roddick Dvorak, Scott Mellenby. You never knew who was going to punish you that night. So the unpredictability of the Panthers uh, uh, that year was something that got teams a little shook. The defense was absolutely nasty. They weren't intimidated by anybody. Robert Svela, who was a rookie, punches Marlon Lemieux in the face. Right. And and since the league was trying to protect, I love that game. I'm sure you remember that one. The league was trying to protect oh, Lemieux. Sorry. All the refs <laughs> gathered to make sure Slava didn't kill him, but they didn't right. notice Paul Laws and, and Nicholas Sundstrom beating each other up on the other end of the ice. <laughs> you know, so Paul, Paul Laws had the greatest thing said about the the song. I fought the loss and, and the loss won. Yes, it was probably one of the coolest things ever back then. And to be honest with you, right after the Panthers just won the Stanley Cup. I, I had Billy Lindsay on Krantz's corner because mm -hmm. Billy Lindsay was you. If you heard the radio call, the final call, anyone out there listening, it was one of the most incredible, yeah. just passionate, diehard fan final calls ever. Cause Billy Lindsay is that guy. And I said to him afterwards, I'm like, cause he said, cause he came on and he goes, I, I really need to apologize to Doug. I butchered the, the final call for him. I go, no, you didn't. I go calls like that will live on forever. Like the, the the Billy Lindsay part of that call will be legendary for the next hundred years down here, Panthers fans and Panther history. I go, you did it for all the fans. That was a fan calling the game, and I'm I'm happy about it. I go, the only problem is, is that probably after Reinhardt's goal at the end to, to give them the two one win or Bobrovsky's great saves during you know the Stanley Cup run, your highlight back in the early nine or mid nineties probably not the greatest highlight in the history of this franchise anymore. And he laughed and he goes. I'll take number two or number three with that Stanley Cup. So Billy Lindsay, another great character on those early yeah. teams. Great. He, he wore the sweater. You can take that away from him. He loves That's that right. team. And, and yeah, I mean, it's really tough, man, because his goal against against Boston was was legendary when he oh. dove and scored. Right uh, at the time, and it was just it was just fantastic. You know the, the way he, that's what I'm saying. Those teams were great. They were good. They break up the team a little bit, and then Wayne Heizenga sells the team in, in 2000. And one, and then we we got we we had some decent years at times. We, we had Pavel Pavel Berry, the Russian Rocket, and so on. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. The team could never reach the success that it reached, you know, in his early years uh, with John Van Beesbrook and Don McLean as the head coach. One uh, one person I wanted to talk about was Roberto Luongo. We just talked about before the show started that from 2000 to 2006, his first run as a Panthers goalie, his time here was wasted. Uh, his time here was wasted because he was one of the more elite goaltenders in the NHL. But in many cases, they never made the playoffs with him as um, as as goaltender. How much do you think the Stanley Cup victory means to him, even though he's in the front office and not you know not minding the goalposts? I think because he's in the front office, because he's around this team, because the ownership loves him, that this meant everything to him. Um, he, yeah, of course he would love to have won one himself. Of course he would like to have had one that. He's the guy with the Panthers more than anything. I know he yeah. played for your other two. That's fine. But in that Panther jersey to him would have been everything to win it. The fact that they were able to win, he was part of the organization, a part of this team. And when I mean team, maybe not the players on the ice, but the Florida Panthers organizational team, this meant everything to him. I was so happy to see the picture with him. What was it like two or three days later eating a bowl of pasta out of the Stanley Cup and getting the shredded Parmesan cheese on top? Like people are like, oh, I can't believe someone would do that. No, let me tell you something. We've seen the craziest things in that Stanley Cup over the years. They could wipe that thing out real quickly and put something else in it real quickly right after that. I was very happy with Roberto Luongo. And Louie, by the way, those first couple six years or whatever, elite goaltender with a crappy team around him, those were kind of lost years. We talked about that a little bit beforehand also. They were lost years. It stunk because if they had a better team around him, not only would he have been the goalie that probably was the heralded goalie around the NHL, but the team probably would have gotten to the Stanley Cup because of him a couple times. Because when you have a good goalie in the NHL, a really good goalie, the rest of your team can be a little bit above average and you can make a run. He was elite from that six-year span, that first run with the, with the Panthers. 
he was one of the elite two or three goalies in the league. He just had a crappy team around. Yeah, well, it's, it's like we talk about John Van Beesburg. The, they, those, those guys weren't great, but they were efficient. Right. Right. They were very efficient. Robbie was efficient. Stu Barnes. I, I remember, I think that's the trade that I think hurt the franchise when they traded Stu Barnes. I believe it was to the to the Penguins, if I'm not mistaken. They traded him yeah. off and they picked up Chris Wells from the, from the I think it was the IHL, you know, the IHL at the time. Supposed to be a good goal scorer compared a little bit to Eric Lindros a little bit because of his size. But but the team was never the same. But John, when he was mining the post at that time period, because they were efficiency, because you never knew who was really going to score, even though you had these goal scores, he uplifted that team. Right. Game four, they were they they should have they, they were getting swept, double overtime, zero zero. That man made some amazing saves for that for that for the hockey club. Fast forwarding over to Robert, Roberto Luongo, Roberto Roberto never had really those guys that I mean, Oli Jokinen was was a, was a good player, but right. but he never had like you know the Niedermeyers, he never had the Screwlins, he never had the Dvorak, he never had those guys that they were just you know so full of grit that oh you're not gonna you can't score, I got you man. I'm a, I'll 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 kind of dive into the goalie. And, uh, I'll do whatever I have to do, not get a penalty. He never had those guys, you know, right. on his team, you know. So so it was nice to see him in Game Seven bang that drum. All right, oh, yeah. it was 100. Nice percent And it was nice to see him also in the in the rally bang that drum again because it was really the cup was really a win for him as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it was just good for Luong. Listen, it's even good for a guy like Van Beesbrook to be a part of the organization. And finally get that. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, the only thing that would have made me a little, that would have made me happier because nothing actually could have made me happier than that game seven win was if they, if Luongo banged that drum and right next to him was Van Beesbrook. Like yeah. the two biggest names basically in the history of this franchise, uh, those two guys. There have been big names here before. You said it before, Pavel Bure. There have been, I mean, Yager played for this team. There have been yes. huge names that have played for this team, monstrous Hall of Fame names. But those two guys in the history so far, this 30-year history of this team and this franchise, if we're talking about the – and I know that everyone uses this and Hawk used this and I've used it. We're talking about the Mount Rushmore Panther players. Those two guys already have their two heads on there. Yeah, you can put whatever totally two agree. other two heads. We can debate on the other two heads that go on there. Barkov needs to be one of them, so there's really only room for one more after that. But that's it. That's the only thing that could have made me happier that night. But he couldn't have taken away anything from that night for me because I have never, as a South Floridian born and raised, grew up on football and basketball and baseball, never with hockey. I could have, you could have laughed. The, the 12-year-old Zach would have laughed at the 45-year-old Zach as he paced through the living room during game seven and and, and was, oh, oh, at every play that was going on, especially, if, if, you know, if the Panthers weren't scoring. It's amazing what a team like that can do to a community because I promise you this. I would be shocked if in the beginning of next season and through next season, as long as the Panthers are playing well, if at home in Sunrise, that place is not sold out every single night because they finally, that fan base was always good uh, to a point, never to sell out that arena. But now at this point, there should be some sort of waiting list because there is going to be a lot of young Panther fans. And that's what the Marlins didn't do right. But the Panthers are by getting another generation of kids involved so that those kids can get their kids involved and blah, 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 all the way down the line. Marlins did it wrong. Panthers have finally done it right. Big, big props to the new ownership because I know we were just talking about Wayne Huizinga. When Wayne Huizinga sold the team, everything went downhill for about 20 years. When Vinny Viola came with Doug Sifu and they really started doing things their way, but look, Vinny is an Army guy. He's a military guy. They kind of built that presence inside the arena, inside their franchise. When that started to happen, and then you started seeing guys like Sean Thornton in a role upstairs, Roberto Luongo in a role upstairs. Randy Moeller went from radio guy to communications guy, and now back on TV. They do it right. They've done it right. And by the way, best move they probably made is not a player personnel move, but an upstairs move, bringing Bill Zito into the mix yeah. and letting him run this team. Yeah, I agree with you. I, when I was on vacation, I was talking to a hockey fan over you know, over from Philly, and and he was asking me about you know like the South Florida fan base here. I go, listen, man, the South Florida fan base. You can criticize it all you want, but we don't. South Florida fan base will not support a crappy product, right? And and, and they will not support ownership that that's disloyal to the fan base. And that's what's, right. what's going on with the Marlins. The Marlins, right? In general, whether it was Heisinga, whether it was John, well, John Henry, you know. Whatever you could make a case for John Henry, you know, kind of got a bad deal, whatever. Right. But as far as as far as selling the team and then oh, here's the stadium. Oh, we're gonna still sell off players. They've never been able to build trust with the fan base. And that's something that the Panthers 
have done. They've uh, the Heat have done it, you know, with Pat Riley, Mickey Arison, Eric Spolstra. The Heat have done it, so the Heat have earned favor with the, the city of Miami. The right. Dolphins are are a team that listen. Say what you want about Stephen Ross. The guy wants to win. The guy wants to win. He's going to hire Stephen the best Ross guys. Is a great owner. I, I know that a lot he of people. Is. He, Stephen Ross has never said no to a big check to to hand out to bring a player in if they if that could help. The problem with Stephen Ross in the beginning when Stephen Ross was here was that there were too many voices in Stephen Ross's head uh, give, telling him what to do or who he should hire or this and that and blah, blah, blah. Let this person run the football team. That's where the problem lied. Stephen Ross, in general, out of the 32 teams in the NFL, has got to be a top five owner for the fact that he'll do anything to help this team. It might not be the right move at the time because it was another GM trying to build this team, but whatever moves are made that he that is, he's told can help this team, he will do, and he will – a lot of owners won't. They, they're on the cheap. They want to make sure that they're under the budget or this and that. Listen, Mickey, that has been Mickey Harrison's thing for a long time, too. One of the great owners in South Florida history, but also known to a point to be a little bit cheap. when yeah. if, if, To pay a little bit extra to, over, to go over the cap to bring in another guy. We're not doing it. We're staying put. But it's worked. If he hasn't won, if Mickey Harrison never won titles or the big three never, never came about, Mickey Harrison would be ripped. Instead, what he's done was... He put Pat Riley in charge. He told Pat Riley, I never want to go over the, the budget of what we're going. So build it through that. Work your way. Do your thing. What Pat Riley's done, when Mickey Harrison has done to the Heat franchise, put them right over the top. But I, I just, I, I'll get it into an argument or a debate with somebody who tells me Stephen Ross is a bad owner because I'll just bring up the fact that any check that needs to be written, and that's the most important thing from an owner, is writing those checks and bringing in player personnel and hiring the right people. You could criticize Stephen Ross in the beginning for hiring the wrong people or listening to the wrong people, but you can never criticize him when he's trying to make this team better, the stadium better, or whatever it is around it. So I give Stephen Ross props for that, but we can get into any kind of rumbling match out there for anyone that says Stephen Ross is a bad owner. No, I agree with you. I think he's been a good owner. I think he's an owner that cares. I think he's an owner that wants to right. you know, maximize his franchise. Uh, I mean, the criticism of him is that he treated like a hobby, but I mean... Right. Even if he did treat it like a hobby, he's he's invested in his hobby. He's made nice renovations to the stadium. He's brought in F1. He's brought Metallica. <laughs> right, 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 right. God, sir. He's brought Just in. Wait. Isn't it, a, aren't we a couple months away from that Taylor Swift concert coming down here? Just yeah, wait. Taylor Swift as well. Wait, wait for that weekend, folks, if you live in South Florida, because I promise you this. I'm not going <laughs> to that concert. My wife's not going to that concert. My kid's not going to that concert. I won't be anywhere near Dade County during that weekend because i know what it's going to be like but it's stephen ross's reason the reason of yeah. stephen ross's what he did to that stadium how he's made that stadium elite around the entire country to where world cup games are being played El classico here. yep right el classico is being played on like you said f1 there's only two places in the united states where f1 races it's here in las vegas las vegas was the obvious choice because it's las vegas but miami now is that obvious choice also for big events it's Stephen Ross that's done it. They're not going to the arena, you know, the Kasaya Center, or they're not going to Amherst Bank, and they're not going to the Space Stadium in, in Little Havana. I like calling it the Space Station. In Little <laughs> Havana. They're not going to any of those places. They're all going to the destination in South Florida, which yeah. is Hard Rock Stadium. Yep. And it's like that because of Stephen Ross. So all you Swifties out there, thank him for that. All you college football fans, thank him for the national championship game and this year with the Orange Bowl in the playoffs. Thank him when Super Bowls are coming down here, F1 races, Miami Open, any of that stuff. Yeah. It's because of Stephen Ross. Stephen Ross saved a lot of that stuff. Say what you want about Stephen Ross. I'm glad he's an owner of one of my teams in South No, I totally, I totally agree with you, especially yeah. having Jeffrey Loria as an owner for so many oh, years. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. And, and Samson as his president. Oh. You, know, you know, so, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean come on, guys. Bad- Top, Come on, bottom ownership management yes. whole deal, Mr. Art Dealer. Right, and <laughs> right, and there's so many people out there that just don't understand how good we have it with some of these teams. Yeah. Even Inter Miami with the Moss Brothers. Yes, what what they're going to end up doing once the stadium gets built or whenever it's going to Mel Reese, whatever the case is. But even before that, going to Fort Lauderdale, going to Lockhart Stadium, which is the legendary. Stadium for basically high school football and my and and when baseball used to come down here a hundred years ago and play in Fort Lauderdale, what he's done there, what the Moss brothers did there as a rental for a couple of years, bringing in Messi and paying for all this Suarez, you name it. There's no way 10, 12 years ago we could be having a conversation where you thought Messi would be playing in Miami. I don't care if 
Messi is 70 at this point. He's still in an inter Miami Jersey, which is pretty damn cool. So yeah. yes, we have pretty good owners down here for yeah. most of the teams, the professional teams. Still, you could say whatever you want about the Marlins, but they're a different story. But the rest of the teams here, yeah. the Heat, Dolphins, the Panthers, Inter Miami, we got pretty good damn ownership down here. Yeah. And, and for those, and if you're a Marlins fan, from what I've heard, and I think it's true, Jorge Moss wanted to buy the Marlins, but Jeffrey Loria yeah. wouldn't sell to him. Uh, wouldn't sell to him. So that's how we have, you know, the collective group of Bruce Sherman, you know, who's, uh, right. who, who's ba- is basically run by the investors. And Jorge Moss would have been a owner, a legit, a uh, full authority owner of the Marlins if uh, Jeffrey Loria would have sold the team to him. But of course, he was not going to sell the team to him because Jeffrey Loria hates the city. <laughs> right. took so his why 1. would he sell to one billion of the, one and left? Here. Right. That's yeah. he Took his one point one billion and left town, and he'll never come back. And laughs every day at the fact that yeah. he got the team for like one hundred and sixty million and sold it for ten times that. Good for him. Yeah. Good businessman. The whole deal. But. You know, and me and you were talking beforehand about comic books and stuff. The what if in Marvel comics, what if Jorge Moss and the Moss brothers bought the Marlins? I would love to see the end of that yeah. story, or at least how that story would go, because these are guys that would spend money. We've seen it. Obviously, Messi, Suarez, all the guys yeah. they brought in mm-hmm. did what they did to Lockhart Stadium by like liver giving it the best facelift South Florida's ever seen. Sorry, all you ladies out there. But that's the best facelift anything has ever seen in South Florida. Any plastic surgeon would say that. Um, what they've done there, I just would love to have seen the story in the direction of the Moss brothers paid 1.1 billion or whatever it was, bought the Marlins, and let's see what they would do with the team from there. It's a great what if moment in South Florida history. There's plenty of them, but that one to me, I wonder if the Marlins would ever be as popular as some of the other teams down here if the Moss brothers bought it, had that stadium put money into the team, kept their stars around, built their stars, brought in big manager names, the whole deal. I wonder what that story would look like down here in South Florida. Yeah, it would have been a different story because the Marlins would have been more consistently winning. So I think that's yeah, uh right. that, that would have been I think the, I think they would have been the Panthers. Uh yeah. I wanted to go back a little bit to what you said about the bandwagon of, you know, people jumping on with the Panthers. I've always liked hockey, but I've been more of an NBA fan myself, so I've always liked the Heat more, so the Panthers and Heat they overlap their seasons, so if I had right. so usually choice wise, I would always pick, I would always pick the Heat over the over the Panthers. I said I would change that this year because now the Panthers are kind of superseding the Heat in terms of success. So I will be covering right. the Panthers a little bit more on the show. But I've always, I mean, I've always kept up, you know, to to the moves, you know, to the moves and changes and whatnot uh, with the team. So I was very happy when I saw Vinny Viola take over the team. I like the the military aspect of things because you know they're going to be organized and structured, right? And, and Bill Zito, man, talk about a guy that loves a uh, loves the game. His rage <laughs> in the last that water bottle, right? Two that's... losses, man. I like that from my GMs, man. I have to admit, I really like seeing that. All right, but you as know who well. that reminds you? Think about who that could remind you of, Pat Riley. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, if Pat Riley didn't have, if he didn't sit in those amazing seats for every game, because they have amazing seats for those. When he sits next to Andy Ellisberg and Alonzo right there on the court, I've actually sat near them and been like amazed that they're sitting almost with fans. If he was in a suite with no cameras on him and a bad play was made or something like that, dude, it wouldn't shock me at all. Pat Riley threw a chair through a window. You know what I mean? <laughs> so seeing Bill Zito's passion, Bill Zito is two years away from being the second best GM uh, of all time down here in South Florida if they can continue to win. I'm not saying Stanley Cup – and Stanley Cup, he has to win Stanley Cups. They've won one, got to one. But if this team is a contender for the next couple of years and Bill Zito is the architect of all of this, including that humongous trade, which we all kind of were like, whoa, with Huberdeau a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, Pat Riley will always be, in, until something else happens, the number one general manager president of a team in South Florida history. Mm-hmm. Bill Zito could easily take that number two spot, which is crazy that I'm saying a hockey GM could do it down here, but he's done such a good job since he's taken over the reins that he's very close to being there in my mind. Yeah, I think so too. I think Chris Greer would do it if he wins the Super Bowl. And Chris, well, first off, yeah. any Dol- the Dol- the next Dolphin coach to win a Super Bowl uh, yeah. with that GM and the, Tom Gart, whoever the president is and owner, will end up being number one in everyone's book because it's been so damn long. Yeah, it's, I mean, we're still talking about the '72 team. <laughs> Me and you are pretty old guys. We're st- we still were six, seven years away from being born when that 17 team won. It's been a long time. 
I wore a shirt yesterday that that said, "I want to party like it's 1973." <laughs> right, right. Seriously, like it's, that, it's just that was been a so damn shirt. long. Listen, I worked with I worked with Joe Rose for almost two decades, outside yeah. of a couple of years. Joe Rose was, I believe, either the starting tight end or the backup tight end, the last Dolphin Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, you want to really think about that? My man is basically close to being 65, 70 years old. He was the last, like, either starting or backup tight end on a Dolphin Super Bowl playing team. Yeah. That is a problem. We need to fix that. So yeah. that's why, like you said, you're right. They win a Super Bowl, the Dolphins. Chris Greer is going to jump up on everyone's books and this and that. No matter what he's done, no matter how he's treated players, no matter what's going on in front of him, it doesn't matter. If you win, you're in at this point. And if you're the Dolphins and you win, I mean, listen, you just talked about the Panther Parade. We've seen heat parades down here also where they're driving up and down Biscayne Boulevard. Yep. We saw three of them since 2006. Now we've seen a Panther one. We've, we've even seen two Marlin ones. We've seen a couple of Canes parades since, you know, 19 in the early 90s on. Can you imagine what a damn Miami Dolphins Super Bowl, Super Bowl parade would be like? They'd have to start it in Orlando and then at the end take a boat to Cuba. That's how long <laughs> this damn parade would have to last because that's the Dolphin fan base. Yeah. And outside of that, there would be parties in California for Dolphin people. How about the MetLife Takeover people? Yeah. There, The Dolphin fan base is rabbit. The problem is the rabbit for a team that's above average overall in the last 30 or 40 years, 50 years. And nothing more than that, which is scary because if they were good, I mean, really good, Super Bowl good, and they could be this year, fingers are crossed every year for them. Mm -hmm. I might be a radio guy who's cynical, but I still am a damn Dolphins fan and want them to win. I can't imagine what my feelings would be like when I looked up at zeros on the clock and the Dolphins having one more point than the other team to win a Super Bowl. I'd cry. I would cry probably at that point. Yeah. You and me both. You and me both, man. You and me both. I mean, I've... I've, str I've struggled with that team for so many years oh. and Marino and, and then Jay Fiedler and then, then, uh, then whatever the plethora of quarterbacks that we've had since then, oh. Ray Lucas and Joey oh. Harrington, all those guys, man. It was just, you know, it, it was, yeah, trust me. I think I'll be crying with you too. And I, I'm taking yeah. a day off from work. <laughs> oh, I might need, I need, might need more than a day off from work at yeah. that point. Like that Monday after the Super Bowl would definitely be a day off for me. And probably cause that parade would probably be either that Friday or the next Monday after that. Yeah. That would be, I'd have to take the day off that day and the next day because I would be so drunk from being so happy at that point. From And I would ride to the parade. I would be so happy. It would just be a lot of fun. It would be a lot of fun to see that. And it all goes back to like how we started this conversation with the Panthers. Amazing to see what that was like and the celebration was like for about 72 hours with the players. From Matthew Kachuk waking up in the back porch of his house with about nine other Panther players all passed out from drinking and partying all night to heading to the elbow room, to swimming in the ocean, to that parade. I'll tell you what, if anything, no one could take away the fact from South Florida fans and South Florida teams, we party like mother bleepers down here, and we, we enjoy it. Yeah, no, they had, they had a fantastic time, man. But going back a little bit, just going back a little bit in time, Bobrovsky ends up becoming the goaltender. He was pretty much the heart and soul of this team you know, throughout the whole Stanley Cup run. He comes from Columbus. He was a heralded goaltender, but it was a little obvious early on that Columbus played a very conservative style and and really really protected him uh, throughout his career there there in Columbus. Um, so when he first got here, he did give up some goals. People were wondering what it, where his head game was at. There's even questions on on your station of whether he should be the goalie of the future, right. uh, the goalie of the future. What changed with Sergey Bobrovsky that that now he's like literally it's now it, we get my my. Lu Luongo, Van Beesbrook, now Bobrovsky. And then I think right now you, you make a case because he won the cup, Bobrovsky over Van Beesbrook, but you know, he may take Luongo uh, when it's all said and done. What happened with Bobrovsky that changed that made him such an elite goaltender? Uh, you know what? That's a, that's a great question and probably an answer that we'll never get because sometimes it's a mental thing with these guys more than anything else. And it's possible that the pressure got to him in year one and almost year full two here after signing, he signed a monster deal. Mm -hmm. He wasn't playing as great as, you know, he was in Columbus for those you know last couple of years in Columbus before he came down here. So of course the fan base was turning on him and the NHL analysts were all, were all turning on him. Everyone was turning on him. How do you get out of this contract? How do we trade this guy? I can't believe we signed him. What a terrible move to bring him here. Then all of a sudden things kind of clicked a little bit for him. Maybe the team got better around him. So I'll give him credit for that, but I'll give him credit himself for turning things around. I don't know exactly what happened in that guy's head, but something clicked and it could easily be just the personnel around him. 
or conversation he had with somebody. I'm not sure. But this team wouldn't be where they are right now without him. And for the first 16 to 18 months he was here, I didn't think he would ever last. Forget about winning a Stanley Cup. I didn't think he'd be on this team anymore. But something happened in between probably years one and a half and two and three for him where we are in the last couple of years where just things just maybe got a little bit easier for him. Maybe the pressure was off a little bit because you're right. There were times when we were on the radio saying this, the night kid or one of the other kids that are there, this is the future. We need to keep playing him a little bit more to see yeah. what happens. Bobrovsky's here, but he won't be here forever. If they didn't have Bobrovsky on this team these last couple of years, there's no way they'd be as good as they were. Yeah. So everything got better around him, but he got better also. And I think that was a mental thing more than it was a physical or an actual stopping goals type thing. Yeah, because I will say the last three years he's been he's been uh, oh. I, I, I can't say balling. I guess you could say pucking to quote Channing yeah. Crowder. Yeah. <laughs> pucking is good, right? He's Channing's a wordsmith, right? You can. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he calls them the pucking boys. <laughs> right, and it's and it's listen. That's the best part of all this. You just yeah. literally summed up South Florida in general. We wouldn't be taught, and I'm, we're the home of the Florida Panthers. So this yeah. is not me, uh, you know, trying to jump on the Panthers bandwagon because they're part of our team. No, they stunk for two decades. They were bad. They were a team that no one cared about. But we had them on our station, and if there was something else in the in the, to, to play instead of a Panthers game, I'm sure my bosses would have rather replayed something else than putting a Panthers game on radio because no one cared. All of a sudden now, they're the hottest ticket in town. They're going to be a hot ticket in town for the next year or two, especially if they stay together. Matthew Kachuk is young. Barkov is young. None of these guys are 40 and on their last run. That's the best part about this. Bill Zito has built a team that can contend for a couple of years. And with that said, they are the hot ticket in town. So it's fun to see that. But Bobrovsky in general, people were upset in the beginning. I was one of them. People were trying to get rid of him in the beginning. I was one of them. Yeah. I am also the guy now that after the cup is won, I want to say two things to Bobrovsky. First off, thank you for your amazing play. And I'm sorry for trying to trade you after 16 months here. Yeah, I get it, man. I, I heard the Spencer Knight talk as well. Uh, right. You know, I and I, I kind of understood it as well. And I thought that, oh, he's just a product. I, I thought I thought Bobrovsky was just a product of his of his team, not so much that he right. was that good. And I'm glad I was wrong because he made some major saves. And uh, we'll, we'll get into uh, the last five minutes of the game because I almost – I almost wanted to go through the TV and choke Paul Maurice, but, right. but, but, but I want to, but it worked out, but I want to uh, discuss a few things because we talk, we talk about Zito, you know, and we talk about Vinny Viola. They built this team. They, they created a great team, but it wasn't without risk. They trade Jonathan Huberto, who was a popular player down here. All right. And then they, they build a team around Matthew Kachuk, Sam Bennett and Sam Reinhardt as well. They went from a goal scoring team on the, on, on the coach Q to a defensive grinding We'll, we'll, we'll feed off your mistakes team under Paul Maurice, right, in general. I mean, that was quite a shift, the, the, stylistically speaking. Yeah, I'm under, I'm under the weather too, sir. <laughs> I like, listen, the best part about this is I have a mute button, so you might see me cough, but you're never going to hear it, right? Yeah, I'm the same way here. I've sneezed a couple times, you know, uh, <laughs> while you've been speaking. Uh, so, yeah, so so they, they, changed, they changed up the team a bit in general. When you first saw that, and then you saw the transition from this high octane, because they look a little bit like the Oilers early on, this high right. octane speed, scored five goals a game, to this grinding out, we're gonna beat you like three to one. Like, what was your what was your thought process as a fan, uh, or also as a radio personality that that, that covers this team? Because especially since you know it's, it's your profession, and th what, did you like it? Uh, did you say you get it? Um, or did you wish we tried something else? Or were you you were one hundred percent all in? Well, I'll tell you what, after the, uh, what was it three years ago when they won the President's Cup and Huberto yeah. was, had like the, you know, was like the greatest point scorer in the history of the NHL. Yes. He was just unbelievable that year. And then getting crushed in the first round of the playoffs. I mean, crushed emotionally, physically, the whole deal. That team did not look like the same team that played even a week before that. Forget about, you know, the whole year before that. Um, something needed to change. I did not think that the Jonathan, that Jonathan Huberto would be traded. I thought that maybe something else would happen uh, where they would bring someone else in, some toughness to this team. And I did not think that they would oh, be able to get kind of an even for even. When do you ever see like kind of a even for even trade where like Kachuk's a superstar, but he's playing where he's playing and no one really cares? For Huberto, who is right now basically the second or third best player in the entire NHL, and let's see what could happen. I wasn't fully on board with the trade at first. I was like a little questionable. Like, ooh, that's 
that's a, that's a tough one to see happen because of how good Huberto is. And hopefully this Kachuk guy could come in here and be good. But what we didn't realize that always in the background, the best player on the team, Barkov, was sitting there. And he needed some help some way, somehow. And it wasn't from another player that played like Barkov. It needed someone that played a little bit off of Barkov. That was tough. That was a little bit rough. That didn't care about losing a tooth in the game and, and, and cared about and, and laying down the gloves and, and planning a fight like we saw him do. Yeah. In the Stanley Cup, you know, <laughs> in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, yeah. So I wasn't fully on board at first because I didn't know if this was like, wow, this is a really gutsy, ballsy move by our general manager at the time, Bill Zito. But man, oh man, did it work? Did it, did it, did it, did it show what the rest of this team was like? It changed the team, like you said. You went from this high octane, let's score a bunch of goals kind of team, but it didn't work in the playoffs. And that's why they had to get rid of Huberto or somebody. Listen, it easily, easily, and as scary as it sounds, could have been Barkov in that trade. It could have been Barkov traded instead of Huberto, and they kept Huberto. Uh, you know, Huberto was in that contract kind of year, so you knew you're going to have to pay him a ton of money. Um, and and it just worked out. This could have went the opposite way where Kachuk could have been just an average player, a little bit above average. Instead, what he did was come in here with, you could say above average or, or great play, but toughness and a locker room changing guy and, and, and changing this team, you know, go, to go from the whole Quinville situation all the way to fast forward to Paul Maurice. They put the right head coach behind the bench. They put the right player in there to play with Barkov and great pieces around him, great pieces around him. Even the Hornquist signing for, for Bill yeah. Zito was, ended up being fun because it just changed the locker room a little bit. Something needed to happen after that. You can't have a year like they had three years ago, winning the President's Cup, having an unbelievable season, having Huberto the season he had, and being ousted in the first round and think everything's okay. Something major needed to, to go and change. I didn't think at first that the Huberto thing was going to work, but boy, oh boy, am I glad that happened uh, because Kachuk has brought a different kind of attitude to this team. He's the face of this team now, even though Barkov is probably the superstar of superstars on this team and one of the best players in the entire world. Kachuk's kind of up there also, but Kachuk's the face of this team now. Kachuk will walk around. We will never, ever forget a couple pictures from the Stanley Cup finals. One of them is Paul Maurice holding the cup over his head and looking up like, like destiny has finally hit him or Barkov just kind of skating around after the win and you're just feeling great about that. But Kachuk jumping into the ocean with that Stanley Cup will be a picture or standing on top of the elbow room pouring beer in people's mouths. Yeah. That's something I'll never, ever forget. And because of those crazy brass moves that Bill Zito made, that's where this team is today. But yeah, at the beginning, I was very reluctant to believe it would work or anything would work with this team because I just didn't know if this team was snake bitten or not. Uh, signing Bobrovsky not really working at first, trading Huberto having the year he had losing in the first round. You kind of just thought at that point that this team probably is a snake bitten franchise, but man, oh man, did they prove all of us wrong? Yeah. And no one saw the, the season that Sam Reinhardt would have 57 goals oh. in the regular season and then adding on 10 more into, into the playoffs. How important is he to the, uh, uh, to the glue that is, you know, the Matthew Kachucks and the Barkovs and so on? Well, you, you look at all the, you know, and I can't put football in this or baseball in this, but if you put basketball and hockey kind of in the same frame and you look, uh, you could have uh, LeBron and Bosch and Wade on your team. Uh, and, and and you could have Kachuk and Barkov and guys like that. You need a Sam Reinhardt. You need a Bosch. You had LeBron and Wade, your two top players that were two of the best in the world. You needed another guy that was really good, but a guy that could be your star. Because you ask LeBron and Wade all the time who the most important person on that Heat team was say during Bosch. that stretch. They say Bosch. It's not even a, hmm, let me think. It's Bosch. Ask Udonis, who was the most important person on that team? The most, uh, the guy on the team that basically was the piece. It was Bosch. For this team this year, it was Reinhardt. It was Reinhardt scoring that took the load off Bar Barkov, that took the load off Kachuk a little bit and made them play their games the way they wanted to. And it seemed like everybody got a little bit better around uh, Reinhardt this season. Glad they could work something out to bring him back. He easily could have went anywhere he wanted after the season he had and been signed and got a ton of money. I'm glad he's back. I'm glad the majority of this team is back. I know we'll talk about some guys that kind of left over the heart, you know, hearts of this team. But if you bring back 90% of a team that just won the Stanley Cup, including the goalie and their star players, look at the Vegas odds for next year. Panthers are already the team to beat. Yeah, no, I don't think I'm, I'm really happy about that, especially as they've wanted to, they, they can try to go for again, got that monkey right. off their back. 
But I will say those last five minutes of oh. the game, as a Dolphin fan, I've always hated when our coaches play not to lose instead of going for the throw. And we were up 2-1, and I did not see Paul Maurice uh, be aggressive. I saw him play his guys back, and Bobrovsky took a lot of shots. He made a, a lot of good saves, and I'm just screaming at the TV, What are you doing? You're playing a loss. I freaking hate it when you do it, and so on. But, I mean, again, this is why I'm watching TV, and Coach Paul Maurice is in the Stanley Cup. Behind the bench. Right? Behind the bench, because I don't know what he saw. I guess it's the years of experience. But the last 90 seconds of a Stanley Cup Finals, and and arguably, arguably the best skating team we faced the entire Stanley Cup final, uh, playoff series in general looked like they were skating with logs on their legs. They were just gassed from trying to pressure and score so much that when it really counted that those crucial 90 seconds that they could at least get one more push to, they just couldn't. They couldn't. They could, it took them like 20 seconds to cross the, mid, uh, the middle of the ice. So I mean, I was like, I was, I was, I was shocked and happy to see that. Did you feel the same way I did, or did you like, oh, Paul knows what he's doing? Uh, I mean, I give Paul Maurice uh, a little bit of the benefit of the doubt on everything because he knows a lot more than I do. Now, yeah, but, yeah. with that said, <laughs> I still was a little crazy at the end of that game because it was, it could have been one of those fluke goals that tied it that went into overtime, yeah. and then all of a sudden the Panthers lose. Um, it didn't happen, so Paul Maurice is a genius. But I was with you on that last couple minutes of just like like try to try to be as aggressive as you, as you've been. I listen. The two worst words in sports, especially uh, in football, is prevent defense. It's yes. the worst because when you get to that, you know your team is just like you said playing not to lose, and that's normally when you lose or when you give something big up. I was scared uh, more than anything in the last kind of ninety seconds of that game because I was waiting for a Panther player to accidentally fall and give a breakaway and Bobrovsky playing so good, but just being in such a tough situation as much as all this craziness happened in the last couple of minutes, it was unbelievable. Paul Maurice, what he did after, because think about, think about the, the attitude, the mental state of that team after being up three Oh, and now going into a game seven, I don't care what they said before to the media Ah, everyone wants a game seven. We got to where we want to be, this and that. The players are all fine. Those Panther players before the game, including Bobrovsky going into that, before they got out there on the ice for game seven, there is no way I'll be able to believe in, the, in my heart of hearts and the world of worlds that every one of those players weren't so nervous and so crazy. And you know, it was very tight, that yeah. entire body of theirs going into that. And somehow, some way, Paul Maurice said the right things or didn't say anything that was the right thing to say at that point. I give everybody credit. Yes, the last five minutes, the last 90 seconds, I was running around the house like my life was on the line for that. But man, oh man, it was cool to see what happened at the end. Cool to see Paul Maurice. Yeah, you're going to second guess, guys. This would have been a much bigger second guess from both of us if somehow they gave up that goal, even if they won in overtime, but they gave up a goal in the last five minutes to tie it up. They didn't. Paul Maurice looks like a genius. That team looks great. It's incredible. But, man, I still can't believe that we're talking even now about the fact that the Stanley Cup resides in Sunrise, Florida. I know. It's great. You know what's even better? Sticking into Boston fans and Canadian fans oh, that yeah. just flat out, you know, were, were trashing us on X and saying, you guys are a hockey town. How, oh, uh, when we talk about Matthew Kachuk pouring beer on the fans. And right. um, and, and uh, someone from Boston, I think it was a boss, that said, oh, Look at the look at the crowd of fifty people only showing up. I'm like, dude, that wasn't a planned event. No one knew they were gonna be there. Right. You know, they were just happy to hang out there. They just got spotted and they did what they did, man. So and then and then of course the they have to have it on a Sunday because because South Florida fans won't take days off work, you know, to go to their parades. And I <laughs> and I never argue with these people, but I said, listen, man, the Miami Heat when they've won championships has been on it's been on a weekday. Those parades are packed, you right. know, when, when I've gone there. So even though it was on a Sunday. If any of these lovely C Canadians and these Bostonians saw what was outside that day and still doubt our fandom, I don't know what what we have to do to convince them. It was a monsoon from 10 o'clock in the morning to about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. 300,000 people were said to be have been at the rally. And like you and I were speaking about before we started – they pe some people left after the parade because they just couldn't fit on the sidewalks. Right. They couldn't fit on the sidewalks and they couldn't fit on the beach. So they're like the heck with it. We saw we got our pictures. We got to shake hands with the players. We're going home. You know, we're going home. Three hundred 
thousand people in the pouring rain out there to celebrate the Stanley Cup championship. So for any anybody from Boston, from Edmonton, you can stick it, okay? Because South Florida fans do show up and they do show out and they proved it. They proved it, and we uh-huh. had a hell of a time doing it too. Yep, uh, I'm assuming at this point I'm probably not allowed in Canada for the next 12 months after <laughs> what I said on, on the podcast uh, that I do with Ken Lavica uh, right after uh, the Panthers won the Stanley Cup when I told when I told Canada take it, suck it. Like yeah. I was just like, just eat it. Like it, you just have to deal with it. You haven't won a Stanley Cup in three decades, and it wasn't happening in Sunrise, Florida. So just <laughs> take it at that point. And for the Boston fans, and for the Philly fans, and the New York fans. And all the fans are the greatest sports cities in the world. Oh, you guys are just so passionate and so great. And you root for your teams. And guess where the Stanley Cup lives right now? Sunrise, Sunrise Florida. Florida. Do you know where that is? Because you probably don't know where Sunrise, Florida is. And no, it's not in Miami, Bill Simmons. It's in, it's in <laughs> Fort Lauderdale. Okay? Understand that we are – yeah, I get it. The fan base down here loves a winner, supports a winner. And if you're not winning, probably not supportive. But let me tell you, you want to take pictures of a New York team and, and then Madison Square Garden when the Knicks stink or when, you know, in Boston, if one of their teams stink and no one, no one takes those pictures. They love to take the pictures down here of the Miami fans leaving early mm-hmm. or the stadium when it's only got 6,000 people in it. You know who cares about that? Everyone outside of South Florida. You know who doesn't care about that? Everyone inside South Florida. Boston, my, New York, Philly, L.A., Canada, wherever you are. Eat it. No one yeah. cares about your opinion down here in South Florida. Yeah, and, and you can tell uh, how players feel about a fan base in a city if they keep coming back to that city. Right. And and Roberto Luongo, Roberto Luongo works for the front office. Right. Bill Lindsay works with the, with the Florida Panthers as well. Van Beesbrook, Scott Mellenby. You know, they all they all somewhat involved with a team in the franchise. If they didn't think the fan base was worth it, if they didn't think the the franchise was worth it, they wouldn't be down here. Right. Yeah. You know, right. At all, they want to be down here. How often do we see someone like Gary Sheffield at, at Marlins events? We really right, don't. Right. We don't. Really don't we, want. We, we just don't. And the Dolphins, you know, the Dolphins will have you know alumni days, and uh, with the Heat, you you do see guys come back. You'll yeah. see like, the Dwayne Wades of the world and this and that. That's fine. Listen, we have a good sports uh, market down here. We do. We the only problem is is that when when a team is losing, the interest is lost. There's no interest right now in the Marlins, and I'm sorry to the Marlins organization. Because I actually like some of the people that work up there in the marketing division and that I'm friendly with them. And they have a very tough job. And some of those same people worked for the Panthers during that 20-year stretch when they stunk. And I felt bad for them then also because no one cared about the Panthers at that time. The only team right now, well, I'll say there's two teams. There's two teams in South Florida. It's the Dolphins and the Heat. They could be 1-16 and on the season, and the Heat could be 10-60-72 and for the season. And there'll still be some fans in the stadium. Not a lot, but there'll still be some there. The other teams, when they're losing, no one goes. And that's just because the Dolphins have been here for 100 years and the Heat have won lots of championships. The Panthers at this point have put themselves in that pantheon. until the And even with the Marlins winning two World Series after that, no one really cared because of how bad it was. Yeah. South Florida fan base, you say what you want about us. That's plenty fine. We don't care. We know we're going to get it from you. But as long as we could win some championships down here and host big events... I don't care what anyone's opinion is. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Zach. We're on the same page. Uh, the Panthers lose a guy like Ryan Lomberg and a couple of other people. Uh, that's just the way the nature of the beast goes. Hockey right. has a very strict salary cap. Um, the Panthers, but they will be bringing, they, they, they have signed to long to long term contracts, their core pieces, guys like Ryan Harkachuk, et cetera. What do the Panthers go from here to replace a guy like a Lomberg that was a tough physical guy and was one of the heart and souls of the team during this run? I trust in Bill Zito. I trust in Bill Zito to figure something out at this point. Until until Bill Zito makes a wrong move and a mistake, a big mistake, I get it. Ryan Lomberg uh, walking around with his shirt off for five, six, six days straight here after the winning the Stanley Cup. The guy's a legend. He'll always be a legend here in South Florida. He can go play for 10 more NHL teams, retire in South Florida. The guy will never have to pay for a dinner for the rest of his life down here in South Florida. Miami, Dade, Broward, doesn't matter. Palm Beach, Key West, whatever it is. All the, from Orlando, like I said, to keep to the to Cuba, he'll never pay for a goddamn meal. But this happens in sports. It happens. Guys cash themselves out. Some guys get paid. Some guys don't to stay home. I'm sure Lomberg would love to have stayed down here. The money wasn't there. 
I trust in Bill Zito to make the right moves. He's got money behind him. Like you said, it's a very strict salary cap. It's not really one where you could do like in the NFL where we'll give you a big signing bonus and sign you to a, yeah. a smaller type deal. And the money's on the table. You see it, and that's what they're going to get. The only thing I could say, and I've said it twice already, if Bill Zito says this guy's a good replacement, I'm on board. And Bill Zito's proven to me so far in the couple of years he's been here that every move he's made has been a pretty good to really good yeah. move and no real crappy moves. And that's the good news. The good news is, is that he hasn't made seven crappy moves and three good moves. He's made basically seven good moves and probably three moves we don't know were a little bit off the books or not so great. It doesn't matter. When you're winning and you have the good people in place, that's all that matters. I, I feel bad for not having Lomberg here next year. He'll probably end up going somewhere for two or three years and then maybe even coming back at that point to play and finish his career down here because that's what I think a lot of these guys will do. And a lot of these guys are on the NHL see what it's like here with the Panthers and this organization top to bottom and the fact it's in South Florida and they got a winning now team and they got Bill Zito and Paul Maurice and good players. This is a destination now for players. And if there's money to be spent on good guys, they're going to be here. But I do feel bad not having Lomberg here and his shirtless self for, you know, next season. <laughs> well, speaking of money, speaking of money, uh, the Panthers and the Heat have a, you should have a good reputation of locking up their guys before they have a really good season and then they hit the open market. The Dolphins, not so much. The Dolphins are notorious for letting their guys go, well, basically taking a risk of, of, of letting them play out their contract and then they end up getting signed for, for, for much more money in a different team because they end up, you know, performing more, i.e., Christian Wilkins, Olivier Vernon a few years ago, Lamar Miller the same. I, I see parallels happening right now with, with Tua Tagaviola. Tua, 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 Tua has had really good years. With the, the last couple years, I'm really good with, with Tua. Interception numbers a little higher this year. I just, I, I think, I think he took more chances right. than he did the year prior. Uh, hopefully, corrects that this year, especially having you know Aldo Beckham Jr. to throw to. But I think the Dolphins, as of right now, especially since a franchise quarterback is very tough to find, he's played like a franchise quarterback. He was healthy all of last season. If he can not make physical mistakes with his body. And he get and he and the protection stays pretty solid like it did last year for the for the most of the season. He had some injuries for the most of the season. Tua has deserved has de, has deserved the money that he should be getting for being a starting quarterback. How do you feel about that? Should the Dolphins pay him or should he play out the final year of his contract? And if anything, t uh, test the open market. Well, I mean, what what's going to end up happening here is Tua is going to be here for the next three years, no matter what. That's how I look at it because okay. if, if they make him pay play on this on this find a year, the fifth year option on this contract, uh, they could franchise him for two more years after that. Okay. So I think, so I look at it as it's a three year deal, no matter what, maybe in their minds to them, that's the best way to handle the situation. I don't know if it is because it's a quarterback position. We're not talking about a wide receiver or a defensive lineman or a cornerback. And I'm talking about basically the other most important positions on these teams or a left tackle. We're talking about the quarterback, the franchise quarterback of this team. If they're fully, fully invested in this guy, then a deal will be done before training camp or through training camp before the season starts. If they're not, then I see this playing out as a three-year deal with a fifth-year option and two franchise years after that. All of that is guaranteed money, but then they have him for three years instead of four or five, if that's what they believe in. I don't know if they're doing the right thing here because if you finally found a guy that could be your franchise quarterback, you got to lock him up. I agree. If, you don't, if he's done this well in Mike McDaniel's offense – in two years, it's only going to get better from here out. He's not all, you know, getting older and now can't throw the ball. He's in the prime of his career mm -hmm. right now. He's a franchise quarterback. Lock him up. I know you don't want to maybe pay that much for a guy like that because he's had some durability issues. You asked him to play 17 games last year. He played 17 games. You asked him to learn uh, or you told him he should learn how to slide better and not to take so much, you know, crazy hits. He did that last year as well. Yes. He is one play away or one concussion away from us having major question marks about him. Of course. Sure. They have the same question marks in Cincinnati. What if Joe Burrow blows his knee out again? What if Justin Herbert gets hurt again? You know, like uh, there's question. What if Aaron Rodgers tears his ACL or his Achilles four plays into a Monday night football game? There's question marks about all these guys. If you believe in Tua, you pay him. If you don't believe in Tua, then you're probably going to keep him on this fifth year deal. But if you let him walk, Somehow, some way, don't franchise him and let him walk. You better have a plan B in place already or ready to go right when you let him walk because you can't just let a franchise quarterback walk out the door. 
Um, he'll be signed immediately after that if that's the case. Some other team will be, oh, wow, we could work with two at this point. Uh, he's not Justin Herbert or Joe Burrow and, and that kind of prototypical quarterback. He's not. But somehow, some way, he fits in pretty good in this Mike McDaniel yeah. offense. A very accurate passing, which is the number one thing for Mike McDaniel's offense. That is what he is. Does he need to throw the ball 70 yards downfield? No, not in this offense. Because you could throw the ball eight yards to Tyreek Hill and he'll go for 60. Is it fun sometimes to watch Tyreek Hill catch a 60-yard bomb downfield? Sure. Does it have to happen once in a while? You'd love to see it. Uh, same thing with Jalen Waddle. Like you said, Odell Beckham Jr. This is the best uh, trio of receivers in the league right yeah. here in Miami. It is. We could debate it. I'm sure other teams would say, oh, what about our guys? That's fine. But Odell Beckham as your number three guy, pretty pretty darn good three guy if he's healthy and he can play with a chip on his shoulder too because people are saying he's got nothing left in the tank. Okay, perfect. I'd even at this point sign Jarvis Landry to, to be your fourth receiver. <laughs> just to, I would, I, I'd start signing guys with chips on their shoulders that have something to prove and just put all those guys around too at this point because so that everyone will want the ball and want to play well. That's fine. I just think if you've got Tua and you think he's your franchise quarterback, pay the guy, get it over with because every question, the second camp opens, the camp, camp normally opens with the coach coming out and talking first, practice going on. And then everything happens from there. What do you think the first 25 questions of that press conference is going to be if somehow, some way, there's any kind of word of a Tua deal not being done and Tua might be sitting in, not sitting out, not holding out where he's not going to show up because those days are over for guys. Guys are always like Christian Wilkins last year showed up, participated in some stuff, and just kind of sat on the side of the rest. If we see video from, or you're at camp day one, and two is not throwing balls with, with the first team, and he's sitting on the sideline kind of stretching or doing whatever, I think it's a problem. I think it's a major problem for Chris Greer at that point in this team. And in that case, the season might be over before it starts, which absolutely stinks. Yeah. Hey, the guy, if you think he's your guy, and if you don't, let him know you're playing on your fifth year, and we're going to see what happens from there and get it out of the way with the media. Otherwise, all season long, it's going to be to a talk, to a talk, to a talk, contract, 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 future, future, future. Let's just figure it out before camp starts or somewhere inside camp because outside of that, good God, I don't want to talk about Tua every single day in his damn contract. I'd rather talk about the two interceptions he threw last night or the four touchdowns he threw in the game last night instead of guaranteed dollars and how many years are on that deal and what kind of incentives are in there. Just give me a player. I don't care about the contract. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Just, I think pay the guy. I think he's, I think he's proven right. himself. Uh, he's, he fits well in this offense. Everybody says, well, it's the system. I'm like, listen, Teddy Bridgewater didn't look good in the, in the system. Mike White didn't look good in the system compared to what Tua was able to do. So just pay the guy. It's not easy to find a franchise quarterback. We we've been experiencing that since I would say the early two thousands, Marino retired. Uh, and just, just, just make, just get it done. Just get it done. He's the best you've had since Marino. Yeah. Right. Uh, he's the best you've had since Marino. Get it done. And that's the way I feel. Yeah, don't do the Lamar Odom, uh, Lamar Miller thing. Don't do the Olivia Vernon thing. Don't do the Christian Wilker thing where they, they they find somewhere else to go. Or in, in some cases, uh, Tua decides to sit to to hold out. You know, you don't want to put you know your starting quarterback uh, creating that kind of distraction for a team either. So that's where I stand. Mr. Krantz, thank you so much for joining us today here at 305 Sports Now. It was a lot of fun having you on. But actually, I have one more question before before you start plugging your stuff. I have one more question. You, you told me you're a Star Trek guy, and you told me you're a Star Wars guy. Okay, from what I from what I understand, and 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 the the, the geek fandom that is Star Wars and Star Trek, you are not allowed <laughs> to like both. Okay, where do you stand on that? And what do you say to people who tell you you need to be pick one of them? <laughs> Anyone can rip me for loving both. I also like Marvel and DC. I also like, you know what? I like something that's going to entertain me. And I am a sci-fi guy. If something's going to entertain me, and at on a Monday I watch Star Trek, and on Tuesday I watch Return of the Jedi, and then I go back to Star Trek on Wednesday, you can rip me all you want. I'm going to stay entertained, and I'm going to like what I like. I'm going to watch a Spider-Man movie on Monday, and I'm going to watch Justice League on Tuesday, and I'm going to watch Wolverine and Deadpool on Thursday, and I'm going to go back to watching, even though it kind of stunk, Wonder Woman 1984 on Saturday. I don't care. Most of the movies, if you think stink, I love, uh, and that's just the way it goes. But for Star Wars, Star Trek people, I know that's a big thing. I know you have to pick a side. Well, guess what, folks? I'm standing right in the middle with my Star Wars flag on one side, my Star Trek flag on the other, my Marvel hat in the front, 
my DC logo in the back, there you go. whatever else you want to tell me I have to like or not like. It's the same thing I said to Canada after we won the Stanley Cup down here. <laughs> Deal with it. Suck it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one that didn't think Wonder Woman 1984 was that bad. When I, I had, liked it, but it it's it somehow stung to other people. I kind of like. Yeah, it. I had Dono on uh, about a year ago. He's he's, he's been out here for uh, a few times. I had him on a year ago, and he hated it. And he and he was very quick to tell me it was horrible in his Dono voice. <laughs> it was Listen, horrible. <laughs> it wasn't great. It wasn't you know. It, it, but you know what? I get entertained by that when a new yeah. movie comes out. I get entertained. The only like recent ones I haven't seen where I didn't get to see M Madame Webb yet. Like yeah, I know that that, that came that out. Um, I even watched Morbius and Morbius yeah. kind of stunk. Yeah. You know what? I still was entertained by it a little bit. So yeah. I, you know what? That's just me in a nutshell. You give me sports, you give me comic book or sci-fi movies. I'm probably going to be entertained and not going to give you too much. I'll give you critique on it yeah. or not, but otherwise I'm going to watch it. I'm going to buy tickets to it. I'm going to support it because if we didn't have that right now, I'd be bored. If I didn't have Deadpool and Wolverine to look forward to in a couple of weeks, I'd be a little bit bored because the sports are kind of over for right now until yeah. camp opens or until there's real football games. Baseball doesn't do it for me that much. Hockey's done. Basketball's done. Football's not started yet. Entertain me for the summer. Give me a summer blockbuster. Give me Deadpool, Wolverine. Give me Wonder Woman 3. Give me Justice League 2. Give me Zack Snyder stuff. Yes. I don't care. I'll take it all. Yes. I love it. And yes. if you don't like what I like, just refer back to what I said to Canada. There you go. Yeah, uh, go, uh, going back to Wonder Woman 1984, just really quickly before before we, before we, we exit, um, just wanted to say that I do agree, though, they had too many villains uh, in Wonder Woman 1984. The introduction of the Cheetah should not have been that film. It should have been another film. That's what I think kind of messed up Wonder Woman 1984. They were dying to bring in a very famous villain for Wonder Woman instead of trying to build up Pedro Pascal's character you know, right. a little bit more. And uh, they should have done that for Wonder Woman 3 and brought in the Cheetah in that realm. Kind of like what they did with Batman Begins. They gave us the Scarecrow. Right. And, and they gave us Carmine Falcone because and they gave us Ra's al Ghul, but they did they blended it well, but they didn't want to bring in the Joker till a second film so he could have his own right. uh basic, which is why Christopher Nolan is a genius, you know, and, and how he does his films. Zach, where can we find you, my friend? I know you're in QEM, but I, I still know you're involved in the podcasting world. So let us know where we can find you. All right. Well, WQM.com is where everything kind of uh, starts and finishes. Uh, our YouTube channel on WQM, that's where you'll find all of Crancis Corner. If you just search Crancis Corner, you want to watch the audio or the video, uh, both options are there for you. We do about four or five interviews a week, uh, something around those lines. We're never kind of constant. You're not going to see the same. The only constant thing on there is my Dolphins roundtable. Otherwise, it's like this week, for example, Dara Torres, Olympic swimmer, uh, was on. Mary Crippen, the teacher in Dade County, that's like the biggest Dolphins person in the world. She is she's going to be on this week. Bobby Marks from ESPN talking heat basketball and the NBA free agency. We're all over the place. We'll obviously get a little bit more football heavy as camps are opening up. Uh, the Mike Florio's the world, Jeff Darlington's the world. Trey Wingo is a big fan of the Francis Corner. We have all this kind of guests on. But like I told you before, we like having conversations on Francis Corner. Um, we've had some of the craziest interviews, uh, you know, on there when it's e even Dan Marino coming on to talk about movies. Like we've had all kinds of crazy stuff on there as well and uh you'll have a good time it's a good conversation on Krantz's corner by all accounts also is another podcast that i do now with okay. the voice of fau uh ken levica who was up there in west palm beach espn radio for a long time he's no longer with them we're doing that podcast and otherwise catch me all over the place i love coming on podcasts i love coming on with will i do a lot of stuff on dolphinstalk.com uh but my home for all my stuff and my number one place uh, is Crancis Corner. Just search that anywhere. Like I said, video and audio just about anywhere uh, with that as well. All right. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Zach, so much for coming on again. Again, it's an honor to have you on. I've been listening to you for so long. You, Joe, and Mark, when I was either working in college or whatever it was, you always are going to work, you know, with, with those lovely kids uh, as well. You always made my mornings the best and my afternoons uh, feel very, very good as well. So thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on, as I told you previously. Catch them on Crancis Corners. Also catch uh, WQM if you can. Like I said, guys, I've had a little bit of issues with my AM radio in my car. If you're not having that problem, check them out. If not, you can listen to them on Odyssey. Just download the Odyssey the Odyssey app, and it's, it's perfectly free, man. You can listen to as much Krantz Corner. You can listen to your Hawkman and Crowder, always a riot. And of, co and of course, Joe Rose is a legend. And of course, you have, of course, Leroy Horde and Brandon Tobin as well. Right. And of course, my buddy Alejandro Solana. You can't you can't forget him either as well. Right, so you can listen right. to all, all those individuals on Odyssey on the five sixty QAM uh, station. Zach, once again, thank you so much. Okay, uh, if you like what you heard, ladies and gentlemen, please do not forget to like, share, 
and subscribe to 305 Sports Now. Once again, for Zach Krantz, I am Will. Stay safe. God bless. See you soon. Go Panthers. Go Heat. Go Dolphins. Go Canes. Go everything South Florida. Bye-bye, guys.